forecast with you adding in, and that will be the first half hour. Then we're going to go, and at each table, you're going to do a forecast at the table that the table will do. You'll have 15 minutes. Then we're going to get report outs from the table, turnaround being fair play. Then our speakers get to comment on your forecast. So we'll do that for uh, about 45 minutes. And then at the end, we're going to try to do a quick evaluation about what we think are the most important forecasts. So if you came and thought you were going to listen to forecasts um, and this intimidates you, you have 30 seconds to get to the exit. <laughs> So you're going to find uh, that there are two basic approaches to forecast that are fundamentally different. And actually, they work together well. So you're going to find at your table two different tendencies. Uh, uh, one tendency is to put the facts in order. Uh, you can put them along a timeline and see them as a trend. And then you can project that trend into the acceptable future. And implicit to that, what you're trying to do is get predictive accuracy. And you'll see that we have multiple trends. You, If you extrapolate them all into what we would call a zone of expectation at, at IAF, where I work, the, you can put many trends together. And of course, any trend taken out too far stops making sense. But if you keep them in that expectable future area, you get to what you think will be your most predictively accurate forecast. So that's the approach one, which is based off of facts. The other approach doesn't use facts, but takes an intuitive leap. And that intuitive leap isn't seeking to get to predictive accuracy. It's actually seeking to be provocative, to provoke you to think about something quite different from what you expect. Now, when I went to study future studies, uh, Professor Jim Dater famously said, any useful statement about the future should sound ridiculous. So if you're trying to be provocative, you're going to be a little ridiculous sounding in order to actually prompt thinking about something that's surprising. And as you're going to hear, in complex, dynamic, adaptive systems, there are inherently surprises and uncertainties. So this is an attempt to use an intuitive leap to get at something outside expected. And oftentimes, if you take that leap, you can look back at what is factual and shine the light on some fact that has been ignored that's actually quite important that does support the potential. So you're going to have two different kinds of forecasts that you're probably going to experience from the speakers. You're, I promise, going to have different people at your tables who tend towards one or the other. Both are good. Both have value. So let whatever come out, come out and report it up. And uh, we'll see at the end what we've got in our, our final 10 minutes. So any questions about the approach we're going to take? Great. So let me start and uh, say that Jack Goldson, you got three minutes. And uh, I will stand up at three and start getting closer and closer. And, uh, <laughs> Just give me my full three. Hi, everyone. I'm a sociologist, and I work on predictions of what will happen in kind of long-term, large-scale social change. Uh, I work on trying to understand things like where will the next revolution or civil war break out, but also what are some of the bigger trends in the global configuration of the economy. Now, I use both of these methods that Jonathan mentioned. You know, when, when we talk about big crises like revolutions, uh, we don't predict them very well. People in the foreign policy community were caught by surprise by the collapse of the Soviet Union. They were caught by surprise by the genocide in Rwanda. They were caught by surprise uh, even with the Arab revolutions. And they're tired of it. They keep saying, can't you do better? And I said, look, these things are a bit like earthquakes. We don't predict earthquakes very well either. Why? Because earthquakes are created by a lot of pressures building up underground, out of sight. And revolutions are very much the same way. Now, what we can do with earthquakes is we can use history. We know that earthquakes are more likely to occur where they've occurred in the past. We can do the same thing. Social conflict and revolution is more likely to occur in countries that have a long history of instability. We can use what we know about the structure itself. Where are the faults that we know about that are visible? And for 
revolutions, the faults are things like closed dictatorships, uh, falling real incomes, um, new democracies that are within the first 10 years. These are all things we know are structurally weak. But we also have to pay attention to trigger events. Just like with earthquakes, you never quite know what's going to trigger those pressures. Is a price spike going to come along? Is there going to be a succession crisis? And so with all these things going on, I do feel now I can look at tropical Africa and say, tropical Africa has a long history of political instability. It has a large number of authoritarian rulers who will be aging and facing critical succession crises in the near future. It has a big youth bulge. It's facing dramatic population growth and it doesn't grow its own food, so it's dependent on market fluctuations. So I feel pretty confident saying, mm, we haven't seen the last of North Africa in the Middle East. We're gonna see more of those in Africa. Unfortunately, I can't tell you exactly which country or when because the best predictions are statistical. Nate Silver's gotten very famous by giving great predictions that are based on sampling large numbers of observations. I wish I could survey people and ask, where is a, you know, six months from now, there's a revolution, will you participate? <laughs> but that's the kind of obstacle in prediction that we face. Yeah, terrific, thank you. So you have a sheet of paper uh, with Jack's paragraphs on this, so you can look that over if you haven't had a chance to. For the next seven minutes, we get to do the yes and, which means that if you have something you can add to what Jack has forecast in Africa, for example, uh, add it. Uh, go ahead and, and raise your hand. You're not to raise your hand and critique or substitute your own forecast. So your only chance is, if you got something you think can add to Jack's thinking on this, go ahead and uh, raise your hand. Yes? One potential trigger for things like this is climate change. Climate change so as, a, as a trigger. Very good. Yes. Let's, let's so take a few and then, okay. yeah, yeah, but when you're ready, you jump in. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, as he said, the revolution is happening all over the world. At any time in some part of the world, uh, it can even happen in London, Paris. Is, is it due to overpopulation or maldistribution? Here. Can you this question? Yeah, that was, look, is it, they actually, there are revolutions that occur all over the world at different times. Uh, we've seen some in Asia, we've seen some even in the Balkans. Is it due to population growth or maldistribution? The answer, in a word, is when government fails to meet the demands of people, not just ordinary people, but even the elites, even the military, so large numbers of society all join in resenting the government, you get a revolution. Is that maldistribution? Yes. But sometimes you keep the military happy by benefiting them at the expense of others. Sometimes you keep one ethnic group happy at the expense of others. It's when those calculations run into trouble because there's a loss of income from something, maybe climate change in the future. The question about climate change is a great one because it's adding a new factor to our predictive model. You know, we can look at the last 10 or 20 years, but climate hasn't changed catastrophically in the last two Right? But when we have extreme events. We have more extreme events, days. that's right. And so the question is, if those extreme events are a harbinger of bigger and worse things to come, we can take that leap and let's say, what happens if there's a really massive global price shock due to simultaneous crop failures in a lot of places? It will probably be politically disastrous as well. Because we've seen statistically, when food prices go up, we get food riots. When food prices go up in badly run, authoritarian governments, we get major shocks, sometimes revolutions. Given the political structures of the world now, more extreme events don't look well. They reinforce my view because Africa is actually the most vulnerable region right now for climate change. You want to come on here? I can say it's a yes and. I would also say decreasing cost of energy in the economic form combined with increasing social cost of energy. There was an article uh, this morning, I think, in Salon, maybe, about uh, 
regions of instability. And I'm, I'm curious whether uh, whether the, the region that you're talking about, how, how is, is there a way of knowing the area of instability that is that bounded or is completely unbound? I think it's increasingly bounded because one of the things that we know historically is that populations that are older don't go in for violence. They may go in for peaceful protest and nonviolent change like we had in Eastern Europe, but really idealistically uh, extremist, uh, zealot type revolutions occur where there are a lot of young people. And you can actually divide the world into countries that still have a lot of young people and those where the population is aging very fast, including China. So I think you can draw lines around those countries that are going to be more vulnerable and those that are less. Terrific. One more? Do you think we'll be subject to like repeat offenders? Uh, you know, we had Egypt, you know, happen twice in one year, or, you know, almost one year. So is this going to be a, a continual occurrence or are we going to be looking at maybe some countries nearby becoming more volatile as a result? Again, it's very hard to tell what's going to happen in one country. It's like asking, you know, what county is going to have the most rainfall? very hard to do. But I can tell you that regions will definitely have repeats. Basically, the Middle East, uh, parts of South Asia, much of Africa, that's going to be the repeat zone for the future. I think Latin America is largely out of the woods. And then North America, Europe, Eastern Asia are all aging very fast. And their problem is going to be finding ways to keep people productive and employed uh, rather than dealing with the kind of uh, swing of the youth seeking dramatic radical change. That's terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Round of applause. Well, thank you. Uh, as uh, was introduced, my name is Carl Picnow. I work at the Miter Corporation, and, and I worry largely about technologies, particularly emerging technologies, and what aspects of them uh, are going to be most important to a number of different government sponsors, primarily within the Department of Defense and Intelligence. Um, we take a slightly different view and in some ways a combination of, of the things that Jack was talking about earlier in that when we look at how to think about um, forecasting and when we look across the horizon, we're really looking, we spend most of our time worrying about interdisciplinary areas, the things that are interstitial. Uh, the idea being that in many ways uh, we see the future of technology less as coming out of an individual stovepipe or being driven by a particular development as about the realization of um, what else has happened in otherwise disparate or stovepipe fields having a dramatic impact on uh, the development in the specific area. Uh, this actually has a lot of history in it in terms of how science has developed, most notably the birth of quantum mechanics 100 years ago was really Schrodinger and his cute equation and there's a beautiful, elegant work, but it wasn't until a mathematician came by five or six years later and talked about the work that had been done 100 years earlier that explains all this and allowed things to move forward with the theoretical equations broadhead notation, all these other sorts of things. But we see that also happening in a number of areas uh, in the combination of big data and uh, genomics and biology and, and the development. The reason that the biotech century hasn't taken off despite cracking the genome 10 years ago, uh, we feel is more related to the inability to absorb com uh, uh, computer science and other computational approaches to handle the big data and the analytics that are required. Uh, another example that we talk about now is, is, is looking at things that we will see and then be able to predict what those outcomes will be. And the one I talked about briefly in my note was really in the area of additive manufacturing and the importance of that revolution and what it will look like going forward. And, and we like to think about everything being new again um, and looking at older models. And we feel, and what we push with uh, some of the sponsors in preparation in this regard is look back at the revolution that we already had in information technology. And we think of the vision of matter of software is very apt in making forecasts as to how that technology will move and progress forward. You saw that with the birth of Napster and the intellectual property it created and the problems, how that moved into um, academic uh, courses, Columbia being one of the uh, leaders in terms of trying to shut down the uh, free exchange of their publication of their uh, classes to use the video and other sorts of things. You've seen it through the rise of Amazon bookstores and the idea that I don't actually have to have a printing press to run a bookstore or a storefront. Um, these sort of intellectual property challenges, the way that they uh, overturn the established industry and the way that they evolve in terms of how those industries 
had to change their business model, we think are very apt to what the additive manufacturing revolution will do to more durable goods. And we predict that the, that model um, will be very conducive to deciding how our intellectual property policies have to go, what we're going to do in terms of manufacturing, and what we're going to do in terms of our, both our adversaries and our allies Thank you, Carl. Okay, so you know the rules, additive to additive manufacturing. So uh, uh, who would like to add to Carl's forecast? Yes, sir. You might also bring in robotics as a manufacturer. Keep coming. Yes. Yes, you're right. additive manufacturing, I'm very curious about the delivery of the stuff that things will be made out of, not just the design. Okay, you want to speak to that, Carl? Well, these are, uh, these are all great examples. I mean, they all, they, the first two in particular fit in sort of the general paradigm, and they are, they are again, classic examples how do you achieve the same sort of outcome, and I think they will have profound effects. Uh, the last one's a bit different, uh, and it's interesting. Um, you obviously still have a large logistical issue associated with that, of course, question will be how basic can the additive manufacturing raw goods become uh, such that that becomes less and less of a problem. The more universal they are, of course, the less that's a concern to the overall issue. Um, at the same time, yeah, there's still, we're not going to, we're not going to, um, we're not going to overturn the railways and the shipyards uh, overnight, but even to the extent that we change the miles of where we distribute and manufacture, um, these concepts will always be You and then you, then you. Sure. See, so you, and Chris, you, know, you might also want to add to that 3D, 3D printing and both at the scale that we're coming to get to be used to because it's more and more prevalent, but also uh, at the micro and nano scale. If you look at some of the work that's done at Xerox Park, where they're trying to do printing of, of uh, integrated circuits, and you can imagine a distributed model of building things where you might actually make your own uh, uh, IC in your, in your backyard. He makes an excellent point in the fact that's a classic example of this. These are actually also examples of additive manufacturing, and that's where I get this idea of matter as software. I mean, as it turns out, software actually is matter. There's a physical instantiation. Nobody thinks about that, but you're actually, well, actually not anymore today. But in the olden days, you used to actually move little moments. You put little metal pieces on a steam disk, and you actually raised and lowered them in a particular pattern. You created something like it. There is a physical instantiation from software. And what you're talking about is seeing that in more durable goods. And I, I think that's exactly right. Semester? One thing I find missing from the speaker's talk is about time horizon. Um, different types of technology have different investment horizon, biomed, um, because the so approval process from FDA. Right. You have to add now the time dimension. <laughs> so um, bio, uh, pharmaceutical be much longer time horizon than say robotics or big data, which is around the corner. Yeah, I was going to say, combining two things, online retail and additive manufacturing, you'll probably have an iTunes store for to print just about anything. <coughs> and also controlling uh, files, particularly of weapons or things we don't want people to manufacture. Okay, other questions? Yeah, Chris, I think it's interesting to think of your comments um, in light of Jack's comments earlier and that you were talking about how technology progresses forward almost in more of a linear sense. And I'm wondering if you also think about some sort of intuitive leap. What's the science fiction of where we could be in the future? And then do you do some backfilling of can technology get us there? Is that realistic? Um, personally, I don't do much of that. But that's a very important field. I mean, uh, there's one of the futurists that do this, uh, Popper Associates and others, lots of guys spend a lot of time worrying about these questions. I think they're very important. I'm not smart. <laughs> Different smart. Hi, um, I have a question more so on the policy side of that um, and the importance of science education policy, uh, particularly in middle schools and high schools, um, just to make sure that we are, as um, the science, tech, science uh, industry continues to grow, that we're also fostering the younger generation. Um, just because if we kind of either fail or we um, we seize the opportunity to really push up the, the bottom and the younger generation just because 
they potentially have, uh, they could either speed up or slow down the development of science. Um, I would like also to talk about maybe the social implications of some of these technologies and how when you bring so many things into your home, when you don't need a printing press because you've got a printer at home and you don't, maybe you have a 3D printer at home and you can buy stuff on Amazon and iTunes and whatever just to and make it yourself, where does the, the privacy and the property and how do those things impact your an entire economy and lifestyle and um, what kinds of privacy, I, I suspect that there will be different types of privacy laws in place as these technologies advance as well. I, I'm not a lawyer. I don't I don't actually know what the laws are. You're exactly right. I mean, Napster sure pissed that a lot of Metallica. They <laughs> changed how all the record labels are done. They radically altered that industry on the basis of, of privacy and the electronic. So good. You're, you're one more and then we're going to um, move on. Hi, I was going to ask, what have we considered the ramifications of uh, globalization being really pervasive and technology progressing? More and more things are becoming automated as we go ahead, and that would increase unemployment and also increase the competition for resources as, as recourse, resources get scarce and scarce. So just wanted to point that out. All right, thank you. All right, Daniel, three minutes. So I look at this in a little slightly different way. I've worked on surprise issues for the last um, eight years with a type committee where we had some really smart National Academy of Engineers, National Academy of Scientists who served on committees pro bono to work on different questions and issues. Uh, one of the committees that I really like was the disruptive, uh, um, persistent forecasting of disruptive technologies because they really sat down and said, we're going to write a, a forecasting manual for the future. So they actually talked about how to forecast in the future and how things were going to happen in the future. So if you want to take a look at that later, you'll see some ideas for forecasting and, and how they looked at certain things like ignorance, <coughs> biasness that uh, Americans tend to have. I grew up overseas and I look at things sometimes from a different way, perspective than others, and a lot of times people don't think about that. So when you talk about, uh, in our previous example was you know privacy and issues like that, in other countries that is not a problem. And so it sometimes puts us as the United States as a culture disadvantage on being able to move forward on certain technologies. Um, I asked a question of three of my colleagues uh, who served on previous committees and said eight years ago, thinking forward from, from eight years ago, what has surprised you in the last few years? And it was, one was social networking and how it has totally changed a lot of things. The other was 3D printers. So I looked forward and said, okay, from 10 years from now, what would I see as a change? And a couple of areas that I really see changing and moving fast are human system integration and human machine inter interaction. I've also seen a lot of changes in the biomedical and how fast things will be changed and developed for self-assembly of drugs into the human uh, body to be able to focus and maybe in the end take away us having to use chemotherapy and seeing some of my friends having to go through that chemotherapy in the past, how disabilitating that becomes. Think about these new drugs that might be able to come to fruition faster than we have anticipated. I think we've seen Moore's law in, in computers work really fast, but I think we're seeing that happening even faster in the biogenetics and bioengineering areas. And um, one of the things that uh, our committee has always looked at were the outliers, because we tend to look at the key little things that you know, everybody's seeing, but sometimes it's more important to listen to that one voice out in the desert saying, oh, what about this? And Sometimes those ideas are the ones that have come to fruition. I know out of this committee, two guys said, you know, I really like what we talked about here. They actually started their own company that has come to fruition and are doing a lot of really good work in the forecasting business. But it was based on ideas of how to go for the future and where things may go and what was needed to bring crowdcasting together with expert views with, together with 
understanding where the data is and what is good data and what is bad data. And so when you put all these aspects together and put that expert panel together like a tech cast that's really looking at you know 100 experts who make decisions on where things are going for the future or thoughts about where things are going for the future. There's a lot of good crowdcast forecasting type of tools that, that are going on right now where competitions are actually being held to see, you know, do you anticipate this is going to happen and what's your expectation of that happening within the next 20 days or 100 days? When it comes to getting over the horizon to the 15 to 20 year out, that's where problems start happening. The 10 year, we've seen a good thing, but the one thing I noted is that experts tend to be very conservative about expecting something to happen. They'll say, oh, it's going to happen in five or eight years. Um, when on some of our reports, we've literally had the report go out, and two days later, some lab pops it out, and there's that issue that they thought was happening in five is now happening. Thank you. So, you know the rules? Yes, and <coughs> any hands? <clears throat> so this is a yes, but probably more of a, a yes, but masquerading as a yes and. As long as you camouflage it, you're okay. You're okay. <laughs> so so, so um, what you're talking about is a extreme growth on, on, on some area looking forward. And you also, I think, have to look for places where there's some fundamental reason why it may not go that way. So it may grow in some extreme way, but there's going to be a no-go zone and as you're projecting forward, you need to find where there's a fundamental reason. So I'll give you an example. Uh, people, people were and are excited about DNA origami as a way of, of doing uh, all sorts of construction in biomedical and, and uh, uh, circuit, circuit development. I'm sort of focused on circuits at the moment. But, but there are actually basic reasons on how fast reactions happen that will say it won't go, I would say, in, in in circuit development. And so I think it's helpful to look when you're forecasting a technology forward to say, is there some fundamental no-go zone? And then you can guess where it actually will go. I would say I totally agree. We've always, in our reports, said, what is the scientific leap that needs to be made? And if that leap doesn't happen, then your forecast is gone because if there are certain leaps that you can anticipate happening and then there are certain leaps that you know it really takes somebody coming out with something totally new and, and extraordinary but if it happens then you know I think one area that one group is really wants to see is, is a new crypto but we haven't seen it yet so so I would add to the your comment about the integration of systems and people people say there seems to be, a, to me, it's a dichotomy going. On one hand, you have this integration, you have Google Glasses and uh, integrating computers and connected to the brain, things like that. But at the same time, you have this other movement to have take over things that people are doing, um, driverless cars uh, and the automation of white collar jobs and, and things like that. So you have these both going along sort of in parallel and at some level a little bit in opposite to each other. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. I'd have to agree. Do you in the back? In the context of uh, human machine integration, I think uh, one of the challenges is to uh, look at the human behavior itself, which is uh, pretty complex. And I say this in the light of infectious diseases. A new epidemic is just a plane ride away. So another aspect to consider is just uh, how we go about reactive leaps. Because if you're trying to track and uh, attack an infectious disease spread, then how do you go about coming up with technology or a strategy to attack with it? One more back there. I think another thing that kind of be considered is how it affects. So if you have a new um, medical technique in a first world country, but you don't have that necessarily in a third world country, how does that affect power relations? How does that affect how you communicate with that country? Um, and then as far as the machine integration of humans, I think another thing we have to consider is laws that will go into that. Um, you know, because if you, if you insert a computer chip in your brain, what, I mean, how much 
of that information is open source, how much of that information should be private, and things of that nature. So you talk about outliers, um, and I just want to add to the fact that um, one possibility, there's a theory out there that with complexity, it brings fragility. So how technology might break down and causing the rippling opposite effect should be considered. I, I think I agree with you. Uh, when it comes to the third world countries, I think we're actually seeing a lot of the uh, research, especially in human uh, system integration and human uh, type research actually being done in those third world countries because of the uh, rules and implications that have been put in place here in the United States and in other uh, EU countries. So you're actually seeing some of that already being done over there, and so they're already gaining some of that information and, and knowledge because they're being, some of those research work is being done in those countries. So I think we will see some transition of those knowledge and, and information sometimes happen there first and then come back to, to the first world. And how to deal with those implications when we have rules that we can't do certain things and they don't is where um, there may have to be some type of um, global agreement on how things are going to be done for the future. Question right here. Uh, is it, uh, one is clarification, one is a statement and a question. First of all, thank you for talking about HFSI. I uh, sit on the phone most of the day with technology and it's for help and it's driving me crazy. And if they can't help me integrate it, how do they help the bigger, the bigger system? And I think people have forgotten that we are in and they're using this technology. But I wanted to ask you, um, did you what what are the three major drivers for these ideas? It's one thing to sit and have people in a room coming up with ideas. I mean ideas are great, but A, what's driving these ideas? What's the what's the timeline to bring an idea? Did I hear you say sixteen years is the farthest out that they're thinking? Is that the time span that a business set? What what I've seen is more um, that when you have experts in a field or a group of experts looking and forecasting for the future on where a technology is moving, they get really iffy about wanting to make any this type of decision over that 15 to 20 year window. They just, they're much more comfortable being able to forecast in that 10 year window than in the 15 to 20 window. So what about the, the great mass of unwashed who are building small businesses who want to take these ideas and bring them to market? What are they looking for? can make informed decisions about who will fund these ideas and to make them into a viable business where they should be looking for their partners, et cetera. What are the practical implications of all of this? I think what we have noted and that we've actually had several um, venture capitalists on some of our committees, scientists who have moved into that venture capital field. And that is one area that you, you're seeing actually changes happen because somebody sees a good idea, goes ahead and funds it, and moves that technology faster than anybody anticipated. And so you'll expect that you know market forces will drive stuff. And that's used to be the government drove where technology was moving. Now it's really market forces in the commercial sector who drives everything and, and kind of the government tries to keep it catch up. So I so I would say that the VC is part of that. The venture capitalists are, are part of that. Um, it's also young um, groups that are starting in small offices, thinking about new ideas and being funded with very little money, but it's more their thoughts and especially we've seen younger people from different countries who have a similar idea, who are then working together and putting something out there new and different and moving that technology forward because they've kind of well, you know, we could do this, but if we did this and so-and-so could bring me that, then I can move forward and, and advance my idea faster. Great, thank you, Daniel. Uh, we're gonna, sorry, we're, we're gonna um, close this part off. And I'd like to uh, ask that you give a hand to Daniel and Carl. And, uh, this, what they've done is primed your pumps. So now it's time for you at your tables. <clears throat> having thought about all these changes and forecasts to come up with a table forecast. So you're going to have 15 minutes and then we're going to kind of reverse so that you get to give your forecast and our panel gets to say and. 
So they'll be adding to that, and they may camouflage a butt, but uh, uh, the rule is still yes and. So you have 15 minutes, and you have a person at your table who will help guide and, and fill out the template and report out your forecast. Go. What's your forecast? Who's got it? All right. Oh, hold it. I, I'll give you the microphone, but this is uh, a one minute, so you can only take one minute. Let me in one minute. We decided that we were going to try. Can't hear. Uh, we decided uh, to discuss how geography will not be the primary source of predicting identity. So looking less at the fact that we will define by our nation and more by what a self-defined community. And we put the key developments are pretty profound for global governance because it's no longer defined by nation states negotiating rules and then get sort of rolled down, but they start to become a little bit more um, fluid, fragmented and possibly uh, suggest the idea of virtual nations where we have communities that may never exist anywhere outside of the ether or technology. We also discussed how this might get some to reject technology altogether, um, which led us to some of the, the, the summary of the implications being just an increased fragmentation, likely um, more complex to come up with consensus or, or to be able to, to get movement in a direction of like global um, challenges. Okay, you got it. Thank you. So, uh, first check is we're either going to have divergent thinking or convergent, and I want to see did any other tables converge on something close enough to this that it's a life, that this idea of sort of virtual identities forming uh, over nations and, and really <laughs> new communities forming around these new identities. <coughs> Okay, you got one sort of. Uh, let's take it like and hear, hear from you, and we'll add to that. Sorry, Thanks. Mike's everywhere. So we talked about how animate, how automated processes and an increase in the number of automated processes can lead to a new socialization. And this new socialization could take a couple of different approaches or, or directions. It could be more diffuse, as Libby was talking about, where borders don't matter, and this could have a positive impact on our foreign policy. Or it could lead to more social isolation, and people could be at home on their own computers, and they could have everything that they pretty much need there. And what impact would that have on reproduction? Um, would people then just be home doing their own things and using in vitro fertilization? Would, it not be, would people not be socializing as much? And we were talking about how there's also some enabling technologies that are required to, to get us there. We need cheaper computing, we need giant servers, and then we're gonna need new energy technologies to keep these servers cool. And as part of these new energy technologies, if they could also allow people to get off the grid, then we can also have even more social isolation. So this is all coming from automated processes and, and new technology. Great. So you've got new identities in male or reproduction. Our group kind of took the, uh, the individual, or the energy revolution. All right, so we were talking about energy in the sense that renewable energy right now, the problem with it is that it's not uh, very consistent. So what we need to develop is better ways to store energy so that you have it at individual point sources and you're not relying on it going into the grid and being fed in at times when it's not necessarily needed so that you can store it for when you do need it. Um, and basically that'll allow us to get off of fossil fuels so countries that are, the economies are predominantly based on that are going to have to figure out another way to support themselves. Um, and that was our main energy thing. And then we actually brought in the idea with um, another advancement is in personalized medicine. So we're looking at the fact that people's microbiomes and their genetics are going to start coming into play and how your genomes overlap. Okay, I wanna, I wanna check, because we, we had, uh, this is a divergent in that it's a technology on energy and then the other one on the biochemical. But first we had the two that are sort of converging on a similar geopolitical new identity uh, that changes the culture in, in effect uh, and creates lots of different cultural effects. Now we've got two new technologies, one on the energy and then the other on the bio, 
medical. So I want to check any convergence first on the energy. Did any other groups hit a new energy source? So our group did something very similar. Our headline was, um, we predict that there will be some uh, developments in uh, creating a renewable source of clean energy. It will be cheaper than the current market for oil or coal. And we think this will happen through advances in genetics and microbiology, through um, maybe some re-engineering E. coli or algae or yeast to produce some sort of renewable source of fuel like ethanol. And we predict that um, these technologies will then lead to um, increased instability in the Middle East or countries whose economies are based on um, oil production. Okay, any others on the technologies of energy or the bio biomedical? Okay, then I want to give the panel a chance to do their yes and. We'll pass that mic down. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I worry all the time about whether technology is going to change the way people and societies relate to each other. And I worry about governments pushing back so that governments essentially don't want people to run off and form virtual international communities. Governments want to be able to tax you and have you call the laws. So this sets up an interesting tension for the future between a kind of global liberation movement of people who are developing virtual identities on the basis of shared interests and governments that are trying to keep order and keep people regulated. Now, if everyone's doing it in their own room, governments may not have to worry so much about keeping <laughs> order. <laughs> but, and, and we're seeing a lot of this in Japan already. There's a younger generation that got discouraged about the job market, discouraged about the marriage market, and spent an awful lot of time online. Even one young man who officially married his favorite video character. So, <laughs> this is a change in machine personal relationships. So, and I love him myself. So, 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 you know, my end is this is going to change you know, politics dramatically. And if 3D printing allows consumers in rich countries to print everything they need locally, then what are people in developing countries going to do? They're not going to be able to follow China on the cheap manufacturing, there'll be no demand for it. And so I really you know, find there's going to be a lot of interesting tasks in social engineering that will have to complement physical engineering. Thanks for stealing those from me. Yes, and. Yes, and. Yes, and. I mean, <coughs> collapse of global economy as well in terms of how it is both a hydrocarbon or a space. Oh, here we go. Thank you. Uh, collapse of the global economy as it is a hydrocarbon based economy currently for transportation um, you have you will have social implications of massive unemployment you will have social implications of co the sort of concentration and coalescing of wealth and raw materials because the raw materials needed for this 3d printing as they become more and more scarce only the richer countries will be able to afford them and that sort of puts everybody else in a bind um, and also, again, talking about the restrictive uh, governments and the sort of the legal system as a restrictor on the progress of technology and sort of where does socially, where does that leave us if everybody starts forming these online virtual nationalities, where, how are they going to take care of their own? Are they going to set up their own governments or virtual governments? And, use it with the, through the use of Bitcoin for taxation purposes. Um, and, but, yeah, sorry. Bitcoin being artificial money, uh, or virtual money, virtual money. I still call it artificial money because I'm a classicist, I guess. Um, but at the same time, and in, in all of this being done in the name of improving access to produced goods and improving access uh, to necessary items. I mean, we also burgeoned into the, uh, sorry, we also burgeoned into the biomedical field and sort of 3D printing uh, of hearts, limbs, bones, etc. access to these sorts of things. Um, I guess that's really kind of where I'm going to stop. Thank you, Carl. I was just going to say, uh, people scare me. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very, uh, it may be very accurate, but it's somewhat depressing. <laughs> um, I take, I guess, a different slant in that I'm not sure how I can add the yes but because I, I look at it differently. I don't think technology runs fast enough to set.
sever some of the human relationships for a tribal animal. We've been that way for 10,000 years. Um, that's always a function of proximity. Yes, technology can help people further apart, get closer, but not more so than people who are actually closer. Um, the other thing is, is as we look at technology, we really believe that technology has been around away so fast that we create a situation where the increase in productivity, the increase in durable goods, the increase in quality of goods uh, creates this bifurcation. I suppose it's possible. Uh, it hasn't happened in the last hundred years. The reason why the next hundred years will be much different. But the end of manufacturing parts means I don't have to have donor lists because everyone's got one. And it means that they're much cheaper, not more expensive, the longer supply of demand can drive them in that direction. And technology usually, usually, vastly increases the supply. It doesn't usually. This one works. Yeah, you got me. So I'll just, I'll just go to that point so I can go from here. Uh, I heard Paul Sattler make a comment a few, uh, a few years ago um, that he saw within about 30 to 40 years a change in the, um, to a city state in, in, country, in countries around the world. That there wouldn't be bigger countries, that you would actually see city states. And that was due to the scarcity of materials and resources. And as those towns or say a Shanghai or a London or are able to continue to do these different types of things to get ahead, that these countries would become the leading countries. You see that happening in some of the um, Middle East countries where they're a Dubai or a, a UAE where they're, they're working really hard to make sure that they're ready for the next step after oil, that they have venture funds and, and, and global funds that they have built huge amounts of money to be able to be ahead when their oil runs out or their natural gas runs out. And I think if you if you think about that and think about some of the for, if you, if forecasting that you know, Paul Sappho and others have done, you can see where that could happen as, as you discussed in the geographic nature. Some of those kind of countries, if they don't go underwater, will uh, will be ahead of a arid nation that doesn't have anything. Okay, thank you. So now any divergent forecast, so it's not the energy, it's not the biomedical, it's not the kind of new virtual identity and, and um, uh, the sort of isolation. What else do you have? Another thing? Well, our table discussion was divergent in and of itself. <laughs> we tended to hit across three major themes, transportation, politics, and health. Uh, under transportation is where we had most of our ideas. We tended to focus on the bigger ideas, but there were the things that were small extensions of, think of what's already in place. So Elon Musk and the Hyperloop over in San Francisco. We have driverless cars and intelligent transportation and solar vehicles. How does that affect people getting around? Then we went a little bit um, off the, uh, the pier and uh, came up with personalized jetpacks for transportation and teleportation <laughs> as changes in the transportation field. Across those, you have to consider how much money is there to actually make these things happen and what is the R&D necessary. Under politics, we were discussing things like what is the U.S.'s position in the power structure in 20 years from now? Um, you know, are we going to be where we are now? Or are we going to be a much weaker state relative to other countries? And an, an interesting part of this stuff, the discussion is places like in Northern Africa, we will probably see countries run by non-state actors. Uh, under healthcare, we talked about you know, what will the effect of understanding the genome, understanding the operation of the brain have on things like tailored health care and human modification? Okay. <laughs> wow. You're welcome. <laughs> you know, the, the, I was thinking about why do we predict, right? It, is it just so we know what's going to happen in the future? You can't know what's going to happen in the future, right? But we predict to kind of alert ourselves, both you make predictions of collapse or terrible things happening, well, that motivates you to avert it. Uh, when uh, 67, uh, Paul Ehrlich predicted the population bomb and people running out of food, that motivated people to engineer the Green Revolution and to invest more in, in family planning. 
And we think about good things, you know, driverless cars, solar, all the good things that you can think back, well, what steps do we need to take to make that happen? And what are possible bad side effects? And you know, this is what I would add. Whenever you predict something really good, try and figure out what side effects you might have to worry about and avoid. And whenever you predict something really bad, think, well, maybe what can we do to, to solve those problems before they get overwhelming? I think that's how people use these forecasts. And uh, I'm hearing a predominance of gloom over glory. So <laughs> I'm hoping we can solve some of these. Keep, uh, keep moving. That's, a, that's an incredibly insightful point. Um, the, uh, the idea of, of where it can come from and then how it can be mitigated. Um, and I, of course, being a technologist, you know, view that technology is playing primary role, particularly on the mitigation side. side, 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 side. Um, in terms of, to try to end, which I think was at some point the point, um, the, as you look at the bio um, and the issues you bring up there, personalized medicine, med personalized medicine and understanding the genome, um, the end is, in my view, going to be coming from things I don't understand, but the sociologist can tell us about is the question of privacy, the question of who owns it. I mean, we recently saw the Supreme Court, you know, deny the concept of patenting aspects of the genome, um, and talking about where that implies the, uh, the interaction and, and who owns what that genome does, who owns that technology that may be only applicable to a handful of people. And, uh, owns your genetic material. Do you get to have it? Does your health care company get to have it? Does it go? So I'm going to go for the end with, because we have an aging infrastructure based on landlines being in the ground and uh, all these different things we built 50 years ago, um, other countries are ahead of us in a number of areas. I know in Africa, middle class is being just by owning your own cell phone, then you can give, let your neighbors use and you make money off it. And so there's a, there's a growing infrastructure or wireless structure that is not needed to have landlines and roads, etc., built that we have already built and have and now are having to fix. So that's going to be an ongoing problem for us to keep ahead of other countries. So I want to take uh, what you said. You didn't give us a forecast for 20 years from now. Is the U.S. going to be roughly where it is in terms of global order, or will it have declined precipitously? And you all get to vote. You either go like this or like that. Let's do it quick. Where are we going to be 20 years from now, U.S. relative to other nations in the world? You actually don't have to vote because the nations won't be so relevant. <laughs> Okay. All right, let's do a quick. Boy, this is this is a true uncertainty. So what what that means is we absolutely if we're going to be smart about this. Have to have scenarios to address that. And I think Jack's point is really crucial. When you do that, you look at what the scenario means, implications, strategies, and then what should we do now to get to the scenario we want as opposed to the one we fear, or the one we just think is most likely. So uh, that's a good little exercise. Now, tables we haven't heard from that you'd like to put a forecast out into the room. Mimi? Hi, so um, we actually spoke on whether, uh, the, where the US would be uh, 20 years from now a little bit. Um, we kind of, we talked a lot about the tension between um, how fast technology is taking off, whereas in the US at least, um, there's more and more government gridlock, so policy is slowing down. Um, and so kind of seeing that if we're gonna get to a breaking point where technology is just gonna be outpacing government so much that we're not gonna be able, at least on a wide government scale, making it widely accessible to everybody, be able to actually implement things. Um, we said whatever country is gonna really truly be able to harness the power of the growing of technology, it's the country that's going to be able to best internalize the benefits of technology and is going to be able to create a leaner bureaucracy within their government so things can be um, in place uh, quick, more quickly. And then another danger we looked at was maybe almost the over-urbanization of some places. So we looked at Japan where everybody is moving out into the cities and then kind of there's no other, there's not as many people out on the right side anymore. So it's kind of leading the, actually, the urban, or the rural development behind a little bit. 
and just kind of having pockets of like big pockets of land where the technology is not actually going to and they're not seeing the benefits of technology while everybody else in the city is. So technology becomes kind of a driver of the have phenomenon and have not phenomenon. And Jack, I know you were talking about that, so I'm going to pass the mic over. So I, I think the end there is how much does technology drive a wedge between people at different levels and how much is government or the population willing to do anything about it? I think this is where we're going to see. I, I told someone, I mean, you know, they're asking me about, I teach a school of public policy. You know, are you going to focus on national security? We're searching for a new dean. And I said, no, I think for the next 20 years, the biggest question for America is to what degree we preserve the middle class by government action. Because I don't think it's going to happen by itself. And the questions you raise about, is it going to be an urban-rural split? Is it going to be an educated versus less educated split? Is it going to be certain regions? I, I, mean, I don't know, but I think the and is, and there's going to be a real political issue, a, a debate between those who have and those who feel they're left, being left behind and trying to fix it. And it's a global debate as well. It's, it's going to be, that's right. The global, national, it's going to be generational, because baby boomers are spoiled. <laughs> yeah. Carl, Ben, do you want to add anything? Okay. Good. You know, I just, uh, yes, one, one more, but I just want to, if I may, step out of the moderator role and, and make a point that we may also start to see technology identify uh, our identities. You know, if, if you have the iPhone globally, that may be a technology defined identity cohort that forms. So it, it's not inconsistent. So, Sarah? Um, so our group actually, similarly to Matt's group over there, um, we talked about several different issues, um, but we sort of narrowed it down to a couple of main ones. One that we've already touched on a little bit, and that is we consider technological advances in travel as well as in um, virtual communications, and we sort of weighed um, what it meant to have technologies like the ideas like the Hyperloop, where possibly cities, um, and, and other communities could be potentially connected that aren't normally connected physically. Um, so we talked about how that would affect urbanization and where people would move and live. Um, but then we also considered that in the concept of um, virtual, uh, virtual, a virtual presence. So does it really matter where you are physically if you can communicate with others um, virtually? And so we talked about that in the context of being able to break down borders and have these cross-cultural and um, national um, interconnectivities as well. And then one thing that, the other thing that we talked about was something that I don't think we touched on yet, and that is improving the human mental capacity. So we talked about improving IQs, um, creating a, a greater capacity for human creativity and problem solving and innovation. And um, something that you just mentioned, which was where does that sort of, um, Way in on the idea of being an, 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 um, an equal sort of problem, an unequal problem. Um, if you have some people with higher IQs and access to information, does that create another um, potential problem as well? Right. Just curious, uh, because when we think of IQ, uh, a lot of people will start to talk about EQ, which has become recognized that you know there's. Uh, how many of you have ever known a cognitive giant who's an emotional pig? Okay. And you've had to hope you don't call him boss, right? Or it's worse if you call him honey. So when, when you talked about that, Sarah, was there, was there recognition? Because I think you're, you're speaking into that, in effect. If, if we become really, really cognitively smart, do we also have what some would call spiritual intelligence, which is the love that says, you know, we're not going to leave somebody so far behind uh, that, and, and I once asked um, Bill Fagy, do you think the rich can ever be healthy if they don't care about the poor? He said, no, but not many of them know it yet. So did your, did your conversation go to that? This reminds me that the point of this table, you said that sometimes you get, you predict something in the future and then you turn around and say, oh, it's already here, right? There actually is already this virtual community 
The one I'm thinking of is the jihadi community, which is a internet sustained, self-identified community that denies national borders. And I've seen in surveys, I've talked to people who do research in Dagestan, in Saudi Arabia, and they ask young people, who do you identify with? Well, their parents identify with their country or, or you know, their ethnicity, but the kids say, I'm Muslim. That's my community, and it's a community that's being throttled and stifled everywhere in the world. And the only place I find I can connect to people like me is online. I wish I could shut down a lot of these websites because they're full of a lot of hate speech. Sometimes there's useful information, but sometimes there's very del deliberate mobilization against nations and targets. So in a sense, yeah, we have this already. We just don't know whether it's going to be a good thing or a bad thing as people start self-selecting into self-reinforcing networks. Last table, and um, it's interesting about that to me is it's back to the technology driving the ability to spend time at leisure, or at least to spend time not sustaining your basic requirements uh, of survival. That allows us to think about um, the arts, it allows us to think about resilience, and it allows us to worry about frankly what are the inequities in terms of resilience intellectually. I mean, there's anything that evolves. Obviously, there's a huge dichotomy from the area of our Dash society where we are today. And I think the point is quite valid about the rapidity in which we're moving through those things and how technology is impacting that. But I like to think of it largely in a public good. So, it's more people moving up, as well as hierarchy and uh, new culture forming out of that? Interesting. I think one thing I haven't really talked about uh, tonight and probably adds to your piece is. Uh, is age and creativity of the age. Because um, we are, have a large aging population that's getting, as we've seen both in Japan and in the United States and in other countries, it's starting to happen more. And, but at the same time, some of those that are being really creative in what they do in their, in their next job, and their added job. I know my aunt went through three jobs. She retired twice and then finally was forced to retire at like 80 something and she just didn't want to. She, she wanted to keep going. So there are a number of people who get, as they get older, even more creative and want to do more interesting and creative ideas. And how do you add that to the mix? Thank you. The technologies change us, but we're changing too. And with a population never before seen, of elders, is there potential for new creativity emerging? So any other forecast from a table before we close off that, that is there anything that didn't get put out that uh, you're all sitting there saying, hey, wait a minute, you can't stop? Okay, then what I'd like to do is actually go back and give you a chance to do a little reflection or a little evaluation on what forecasts you've heard are most important from your perspective. And you can take either the perspective of, hey, this is a leap that's so provocative that it ought to have us thinking differently about what's in front of us. And, uh, and then, or it could be one that this looks so expectable and it's so big that it's really important. And, and either way, if you think it's, it's really the most important, I want you to put up five fingers when uh, I talk about it. If you think it's actually not very important, you can put up one finger and please make it this one. <laughs> All right? So we're, we're going to start with this new identity forming that becomes uh, so potential. And as, as Jack has already said, you know, we can already see this. Uh, it can form around a new identity. It could be a religious identity. It could be a technology. But this could be so powerful as we become more networked and more interconnected that the identities actually transcend or make the next century one where national identity falls lower and lower in terms of what matters to people. So take a moment, and when you're ready, put your hand up with one to five fingers. You know. Anywhere in between is fine. Just want to get a, a quick, quick sense of how important this one seems to you. Okay, 
Okay, this is very interesting. Okay, lots of fives, many fours, some ones sprinkled in there, some twos, okay? Those people are very confident. That's right. Very good. Okay, and then the next one where we went to was, was actually you start to see people moving into much more isolation from the technology. Why do I actually need to date to reproduce when I can get a mail order um, kit? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm probably not giving you fair due. Uh, but, but, that, but really this has a social effect that's fairly profound, that we, we really start to see people interacting more technologically than going out and about. Is that a fair? Okay, so what do you think on this one? Okay, lots of ones and some fives and some in between. So split, uh, but fewer fives than on the, the social isolation. So then we go over, we got the new energy, and this becoming really changing the grid, I think is what you're really <coughs> implying, that there'll be a lot of co-production of energy, a lot of different forms, uh, such that it could destabilize a lot of the countries that are oil, coal based, and well, that's where their economy is. So that's an expectable forecast on the energy. Quick show of hands. Okay, this is, this is largely fives and threes. Would you all agree that this is more in the expectable, or this is a more provocative, the first? Okay, good. So we're getting both, which is a good thing. Now the biomedical, uh, and I think this really crossed a few tables. So. This is one where we're really going to see, uh, I think you first raised this as, as some, uh, Daniel, you were talking about this, where we could speed the innovation loop. And so just as you saw how we went from, you know, AIDS as a death sentence to the protease inhibitors to cocktails, where now you can go ahead and live with HIV for many decades and die from something else, uh, doing similarly with cancers, but also being able to really personalize this to get down to your biochemical uniqueness out of the genome. How many think this one, okay? Expectable, agree, and important, except for, now I wanna hear from you, Paul? Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, well, I think it's not gonna be, I think it's very expectable. And I also think that it's gonna be expensive enough for long enough that it's not gonna make much difference for most people in the world. So this would actually be part of that trend that says, you know, if it, it'll make the wealthier longer live, and many more have not looking up with with envy and anger. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. So in some ways, it's still important, just not the way people are thinking. Not important in all good ways. That, okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so then. We had kind of a, uh, let's see, so we had, I need some help here. So on your table, you really had, I think the big one is the US really altering its position relative to other technology states. And I think I could bundle that. It could be from the city states that you talked about, you know, the Singapores uh, that, that are coming on and that becomes the economic vibrant unit the U.S. in the technology state really giving way to lots of newly wealthy. Is that a, so how, how many would you assess on that one? I guess the first of all is we've got a bifurcation. So, well, the first one is, is it likely? And so give that a five to a one on the likelihood that the, that the U.S. position vis-a-vis -vis other nations and city states, if you will, uh, is really diminished economically and from a global power position. Okay, and this is on the likelihood, right? It's unlikely if it's one. If it's likely, it's more towards five. Okay, this is pretty interesting. Again, a real bifurcation. Now, let's imagine if it were to happen, how about importance one to five? Interesting. So 
I want to hear why it's not important if it happens. Well, I, I just don't think the whole concept really makes a lot of sense. And the reason I say that is because the, the driving factor over the last couple of decades in terms of growth has been about emerging markets anyway. And the reason that we're tapering off is because of the really emerging markets are tapering off. There'll be new emerging markets and those will continue to drive growth. So it's not a zero sum game, it doesn't matter. Okay, okay. so in, in effect, we're still doing fine, it's just that everybody else is doing fine as well. It's our relative position. Okay, got it, that makes sense. So. Okay, what other forecasts do we need to evaluate? That about it? Anybody want to put one up before uh, before we put it close to this? Transportation. transportation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And so actually, there are multiple on transportation. So uh, the hyperloop, the driverless cars, but then the farthest one is the teleportation. So that would be the most dramatic. Okay. So let's start with teleportation because that's provocative rather than expectable. Hey, come on! If you saw it in Star Trek. You know, I got the cell phone to prove it. But actually, you know, there has been experiments of teleportation. So this has already happened. It's not at a scale. Uh, you know, we're not moving people yet, but we have moved molecular configurations. So how many of you think this is going to be a really important forecast, you know, change over the next 20 years? No, this is this is the teleportation uh, development. So yeah, this is on a one to five. Yeah. No, we're not doing it with this is just this is just by the way, you are getting the finger on this. Uh, twenty years. Okay. Yes. Okay, right. Do we have to stay with positive integers or can we go into negative? Yeah, if you want to bite off part of your finger. <laughs> Okay, so this is a highly provocative, unexpected, you know, unlikely, but I think the if it happened, everybody agreed. Whoa, it would be huge. So, okay, the second is especially if one country gets it and can, can teleport their soldiers wherever they want. That, that's yeah, or their tourists. <laughs> Have you been to Hawaii? <laughs> Okay, then now let's look at the more expectable transportation. So we're going to have driverless cars. Uh, we're going to have a lot of mass transit that is moving much more efficiently. I'm not going to go to jetpacks yet. We'll, we'll do a final on jetpacks. Jetpacks? Yeah, but you can't hit anything but a sheep in New Zealand with jetpacks. So. <laughs> Okay, so the driverless cars and the Hyperloop will workable mass transit between cities. How many see you? How many of you see this as really important forecast for the next twenty years? Yeah, both. Really. Oh, you want to put two? Yeah, and you can take your shoes off. Okay, so you're getting fours and fives. This is clearly this is clearly going to be a big one, right? This is it. Are you ready? Jetpacks. All right, all right. <laughs> okay, so we're we're at the end. What we're planning to do, and, and I think David is is going to send out a survey, so that you can really start to score the the forecasts, and you get to see what is probable. When we do surveys, one of the things that we often add is you got likelihood and then preference. Sometimes you create a gap between what people expect and what they really want. And oftentimes if that gap is strong enough, it pulls in a lot of creativity and that's where some of the striking innovation comes. So it's a good way to also differentiate the very, you know, what, what Kirby laid out as highly negative scenario or forecast. Uh, and certainly you pointed that out with the jihadis and, and others. So it's, it's a good way to differentiate, especially when you develop scenarios. You have expectable scenarios, desperate scenarios, and then aspirational scenarios, and it's useful to sort between those. So David, you'll get a survey out to participants here.
And so you'll get to see what the forecasting was. You'll get to see what P we did informally with five, four, three, or one kind of finger uh, exercise to get the sense of what's coming over the next 20 years of the forecast you heard from our great panelists and from each other that's really going to matter and you'll get to reassess that. So with that, I want to say thank you on behalf of the panel. You're terrific and it was great work you did. Thank you very much. So just very quickly, we will be sitting on a survey, but also if you have any comments on this format, on the things that we talked about tonight, please let us know because we're going to be doing this three more times. The next one is going to be September 26th in this space. And the theme is going to be empowerment. Um, we really want your input on how this worked out. And the very last thing is I want to say thank you both to our panelists as well as to Jonathan because the structure of this is really Jonathan's creation and I think it worked well thanks to him. So join me again. Thank you.